Welcome to the Air Combat Simulation Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Together with content creators, mission builders, experts, and enthusiasts, we explore the comprehensive world of combat aircraft simulation. Hello everyone and welcome to the episode 13 of the Air Combat Sim Podcast. Uh, it's episode 13 but it's a lucky one because we have with us today Matt Wagner from Eagle Dynamics whom I don't think I need to introduce. Uh, hello Matt. Hey everyone, Wags here from Eagle Dynamics. I'm sure everyone playing this series knows this introduction very well. So I'm Balding Dragon, I'm here with Goat and we're very happy that you're here and thank you for accepting the invitation. We'd like to talk a little bit, of course, we have quite a few questions from our list, uh, listeners or, or podcast subscribers. Uh, there was quite a big response to our announcement about this interview. And the list is pretty long, and I'm sure we won't be able to ask all of the questions. But before we get to that, uh, we'd like to talk a little bit more about you as, as a person in the lead of, of many projects that the Eagle Dynamics are doing. So if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you start your adventure with the Sims? Sure. Well, first, I'm very glad to be here. Um, big fan of the podcast. Uh, really enjoy them. A huge fan of uh, Jella's work as well. And uh, try to answer all your questions as best I can. I'll definitely try not to be a vice presidential candidate on this and actually answer something. <laughs> um, but yeah, so aviation... Um, it's always been a huge part of my life. Grew up with it. Uh, got my PPL back when I was 16 and was all set to uh, hopefully go to the Air Force Academy. But I was uh, a pole vaulter in high school and had a bad injury that left me without the use of my legs. So I went instead down the intelligence route uh, at CIA and was an analyst there for uh, 10 years, uh, analyzing uh, foreign air forces. But uh, during the whole time since I was in single digits, until um, I've, uh, to now, always been very, very much into flight simulators and uh, started doing a lot of beta testing uh, very early on and a lot of online uh, multiplayer stuff, actually Warbirds way back when, and made some great friends through that community, uh, one of which was uh, CJ Martin, who was a designer at James Combat Sims, who did F-15. And um, they were just up in Baltimore, and I was down in Northern Virginia, so he invited me to come up for the day to see how they make the games. And at the end of the day, their design director, Mike McDonald, offered me a job up there to be a junior designer. So it was kind of one of those forks in the road, so to speak, of uh, staying in a comfortable government job, which unfortunately at that point, the uh, passion just wasn't there anymore, or taking an, uh, a chance and uh, going to private industry and do something I had a really true passion for. So uh, obviously I went down the second route and that was back in, geez, 1998. And um, so it's been over 20 years now, you know, uh, after EA went on to SSI, uh, which then got purchased by Ubisoft and did lock on, did a little uh, stint with breakaway games, doing some serious games, but uh, really missed doing flight sims. And uh, at that point, uh, Nick Gray and Igor Titian say, hey, Matt, why don't you come work for us full time? And I jumped on that chance. And that was back in 2008. And I've uh, been working with Eagle Dynamics as their senior producer since. What were, what were some of the projects that you've worked on? What was one of your, you know, could you talk about the ones that stand out for you prior to uh, the work with uh, Eagle Dynamics? Well, the big one before was uh, Jane's F-18, which it's kind of interesting that I've come full circle back on the Hornet again, uh, kind of uh, comfortable shoes, so to speak. And um, then, of course, did lock on initially at SSI and then Ubisoft. And at that point, then migrated into uh, DCS. But actually, even when I was back in Ubisoft, I uh, did some work on like IL-2 Forgotten Battles and some other titles as well. So all of the well-known titles, actually. 
It's great. For flight simmers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and can you tell us a bit about the beginning of Eagle Dynamics themselves? So we, before you joined, how it all came to being? So uh, I think Nick's answered this a couple of times much better than I can. Uh, but back in, I guess it was early 90s or so, uh, Nick uh, and Jim McConaughey, who unfortunately uh, is not with us anymore, uh, met with uh, Igor, who started this small company in Moscow called uh, Eagle Dynamics, and saw the opportunity for a great partnership there uh, under Mindscape. And, um, and they initially did um, uh, uh, SU-27 Flanker. And um, for their distributor, a publisher, then they moved over to uh, SSI. And that's when they became involved with uh, Carl Norman, then myself, and others. And it all, it all grew really large from, from those days till today. Uh, how, how do you see that? I mean, how, if you look back at your beginnings with Eagle Dynamics and you look now at DCS right now, uh, what are your feelings? Well, we're starting a lar much larger company. Uh, I think back when I came on full time, we were around maybe 60 to 70 people. Whereas right now we're double that and growing um, all the time. Mm. Uh, so it's a much larger company. We're more diverse now, spread over um, uh, several different sub studios. And of course, our breadth of products is much, much broader than it's ever been. You know, anywhere from the modern jets of hardcore and um, more mainstream to helicopters. Uh, of course, to our World War II series and so on. Um, so it's a much more diverse company than it's ever been. Wow. So how did you, how did, uh, you know, you mentioned that essentially you talked to Nick and Nick recruited you. How did you, how did you meet up with him? So when I came on board with SSI, uh, the first project I was put on was uh, Flanker 2.5. And at that point, that's when I really got to know um uh, Igor and Nick and some of the other guys who are still on the team now. And I think within literally the first three months of coming on board, I was on a plane out to Moscow and started building the relationships then. So it was through my initial uh, employment at SSI that I first uh, got to know that team. And I was always wondering, and that might be a little bit off topic of DCS, but uh, when you want to have some fun and just rest from work, what do you play? Well, I hate to say it, but usually it is DCS. Uh, usually in VR. Usually when I'm working day-to-day, uh, -day, I'm in just 2D or using track IR. Uh, it's kind of hard to work in VR, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, so weekends, when I have a little more free time, uh, I have a separate room uh, set up, uh, one Hornet cockpit, one Viper cockpit, and I'll spend a lot of time uh, in those, you know, playing through different uh, user missions and just playing as a general gamer more than anything else. Uh, if I'm not playing DCS, though, it's often not other, f some flight sims, but not often. Uh, like right now, I'm playing uh, Star Wars uh, Squadrons. I've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, Doom. Um, those are probably the two I'm playing right now. Oh, yeah. Star Wars Squadrons is, is good fun. Uh, it's it's really, it has the spirit of the Star Wars series and old TIE Fighter and other games. It's great. Oh, yeah. A lot of good memories from X-wing versus Tie Fighter. So, of the of the aircraft modules, which is your favorite? Mm, that's a tough one. I think right now it's probably the Viper, just because uh, growing up, um, being in Virginia, uh, eventually I wanted to fly for the uh, Virginia Air National Guard, which was flying the Viper at that point. So, I always kind of grew up around the Viper and friends in the squadron, actually a close friend of the family was the commander of the squadron. So, you know, having that attachment with the Viper since I was young, uh, still has a special place in my heart. That's really cool. Now, have you had a chance to play Raven one? I have not. Unfortunately, it's like I was saying before, when I have free time, that's one of the things I'm trying to do is spend more and more time playing, you know, the great content that guys like BD and others are putting out there. Make sure to let us know what, when you do, if you have time to check it out. Absolutely. You think? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I always, I always find it interesting to, to look at, you know, the evolution of, of, of business models. And for me, when we take a look at software just in general, and we talk about a, a product, and I think there is certainly a lot of it, as 
we were talking about prior to recording, there's a lot of folks that aren't familiar necessarily with the challenges of software development and certainly with testing. There's something as big as um, DCS is. But it's always interesting for me when I take a look at traditional business models, how they evolve. And I really like uh, what's attracted me as a relatively new person to the DCS community is the third party piece. Even the even having uh, simple uh, missions that I can download from the DCS website is great just for me to learn because it is a huge learning. Well, it's, it's very true there, uh, Rob. And uh, the third parties, we, we couldn't be where we are without the third parties, whether it's the aircraft modules, whether it's the campaigns and some maps coming down the road. Um, it simply couldn't happen without them. And just the level of quality for the third parties just gets better and better and better each year. And again, BD is a great example of that. No, I was just going to say, I, you know, as somebody that's, as I mentioned, as somebody that's relatively new, having the opportunity to watch on the sidelines uh, as the Raven one campaign was in development. It was very educational for me to see it happen. And then when it went into review um, with, you know, with Matt and his team, and then finally getting released, it was, it was a very exciting thing to watch. And, uh, and, and so for me, it's in the, watching the feedback from the community. So to me, it's really interesting to watch, uh, you know, the feedback from the community, the ability for someone who wants to invest the time to learn the system to be part of that ecosystem. But in all fairness, this is also thanks to how this is, is built. And I found myself so many times inside Mission Editor being just amazed about how much thought and how much conception of how it can be used or how many options can be there added to, to the game or available for them creators. So the editor is just amazing when it comes to, to the number of triggers, options, and things you can do, which is a big credit to the team. And that's why it's possible to do so many things with it. Yeah. And uh, the mission editor, it's uh, in some ways a double-edged sword. On one hand, you're absolutely right, uh, BD, in that it's an incredibly powerful uh, system that in the right hands, it can do some pretty amazing things, um, which our third-party campaign uh, developers have been doing. On the other hand, uh, given the sheer complexity of it, it's a pretty daunting task for someone new to come in there and try to put together a mission. And that's one of the things we're looking in the future is trying to construct a, a kind of in-between level of like an instant action mission versus a mission editor where you know someone can put together a fun, interesting mission uh, without having to spend weeks upon weeks of actually learning the mission editor system. That's pretty cool. I mean, one, one, one of the things that I do, I do use the uh, instant action, and then I, uh, or not instant action, but um, I would create a, a fast mission, and then I save it. So it, it, it seeds it as a, a core uh, one to build from and to learn. So maybe... Let's get back to Wax. And the, there's been a nice question, like from from our listeners, uh, and does, the question goes: Wax has been in the flight sim community for almost all his life. Is there anything that he wished for this early days that he haven't been able to achieve in DCS? Mm, probably dynamic campaigns, the big one. Uh, I remember back in this is probably early to mid 1990s. I was hugely into Falcon 3.0 back then. And I had my own squadron set up. I had, you know, all the, the names customized to family members and best friends. And just spent a lot of time in that dynamic campaign system. Uh, also with the uh, uh, DI's Tornado, same way. God, I love that mission editor, uh, speaking of that. And, you know, either, even though it was rather simple, it was very, uh, to me, engrossing and engaging dynamic campaign system. And more than anything else, that's probably the one big thing I really want to see in DCS. Well, then it's coming, right? It absolutely is. We're putting a huge amount of resources on that right now. And uh, hopefully we'll have something internally to test uh, by the end of the year. Again, I need to specify it's internally. It, won't, it definitely will not, will not be out by the end of this year. Yeah, but I think that's something a lot of people are looking for. Very much so. And then another question, I think it's also interesting. So if if you look at your normal day at work, how does it look? So what do you do? Uh, 
for, for lots of people out there, if you're developing games, it's probably playing most of the time, but I guess it's not true, right? Oh, definitely not. Um, it varies, as you might imagine, day to day. Usually my days start quite early, uh, so I have more time with the team overseas. And being a senior producer on the team, a lot of my time, particularly the first half, is more delegating than anything else, honestly. Uh, after that, uh, then it's working a lot of the uh, contracts for professional users. So where Simon handles our professional users in Europe and Asia, I handle our professional users like the 355th, for example, uh, here in the North American area. Uh, so it's handling those contracts, new contracts, um, uh, interfacing with our third parties to get new uh, things under license agreement. Uh, and then you know, more of the fun part is actually doing some of the design work. Um, so actually right now, all today, I've been working on the uh, AT FLIR design for the Hornet, which is looking really cool. I think people are really going to enjoy that a lot. And then working with our testers, working with our community managers, uh, Nine Line and Big Nui and so on, uh, working with the documentation guys. So uh, at this point in my career, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it's more of the management side than anything else. But I still get to you know, get my hands dirty with some of the design elements, which I still probably enjoy the most. Uh, I can't, can't help to th think about if, you know, real life pilots for them is the same. To, as they get experienced, it's no more flying, but lots of behind the yeah. desk work, actually. Definitely. Um, all right. I, mean, I, I think we could move to... And I look at the list of questions. The, the longest one, of course, is on modules and weapons. Modules being okay. the, the, the first thing. Speaking about the Hornet, the first question I had was, will we eventually get a Super Hornet? Are there any plans for that? Well, I won't say no, um, but I would, definitely not any time in our near-term plans. Uh, right now, we still have you know, a fair amount of work to do on the Legacy Hornet. And I think our customers would go absolutely ballistic if we said we're already starting to work on a Super Hornet. Um, also, uh, the guys at VRS have done a wonderful job on their Superbug. And um, now, you know, not to say that if we had a professional customer saying, hey, DCS or Eagle Dynamics, we want you to do a Super Hornet uh, as a trainer. Well, things could change radically on that, of course. Uh, but at least for now, right now, uh, it's just not in our plans. And there's so many other aircraft uh, in our sites that we want to do before that. Let me ask differently. I don't know if you remember when I had this enemy campaign 2.0, I think so it was a few years ago, and you recorded some lines for it uh, mm -hmm. as a pilot. We did this Easter egg when you would complain about A-10 oh, right. not having the Scorpion, etc., etc. And then somebody saw it, uh, mentioned on the forum that, oh, he heard wax in the, in the campaign, so it means that the new uh, A-10 is confirmed. Well, <laughs> it wasn't a few years back, now it is. So my question is, what should I put next as an Easter egg mm. in the campaign? <laughs> Maybe something with the hind. All right. And how is how is the work on hind coming together? Very good. So we haven't talked about it as much lately. Not that there's not being worked on it. There certainly is. It's just as you might imagine, we're trying to keep the focus right now on the big A-102 release. Uh, so, you know, art-wise, we're almost done there. They're um, really tuning up to flight dynamics, uh, working on the cooperative multiplayer is a big thing we want to get knocked in there before release this time. Um, so yeah, it's coming along really, really well. And, uh, again, once, um, we have, uh, the spotlight shifted to that off the A-10, uh, we'll be talking about that quite a bit more and probably not too distant future at this point. Great. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, so am I. That's another game, actually another DI game I used to enjoy quite a bit was a DI's, um, uh, Mill 24. Great. And now we, we have Kiowa coming up pretty soon with Polychop. It's also Absolutely. Really nice. With Syria Map. I think it's difficult to keep up sometimes when you just can't yeah, yeah. get enough of everything. And that's the, actually probably the thing I like most about the Syria Map is it's just a really, really great playground for the helicopters now. I, I, I'll def, I've already spoken to, and I'm going to speak more with Polychop about the campaign for Kiowa because I'd really like to get into that market mm -hmm. of rotary wing. Aircraft. Absolutely. And any, any, anything, because lots of people were very excited uh, seeing and some teasers, the Apache here and there in Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said in the past, it's, it's more a question of when, not if. Um, I think, like me, um, I think everyone out there just would really love to see that aircraft in DCS someday. But right now, our, our focus, helicopter wise, of course, is the hind. 
Now, now you mentioned that you actually have multiple teams uh, across multiple studios. Are there uh, how many projects would you say that you have going at any given time? Jeez, um, between the entertainment and the professional side, uh, actually individual discrete projects, probably about a half dozen, I would imagine at this point. And for the professional projects, do does that software differ significantly from, um, like for example, the A A ten C two? Well, with the A ten C two, not at all. Actually, they are using the exact same software that you guys are using, uh, which is great too. Because even after the release of A ten C two, they uh, gave us uh, some really great feedback, which we're in the process right now of integrating into a later open beta. So as we start to roll these features uh, for our professional customers, the entertainment customers, we'll be getting the exact same updates. Yes, that's really amazing to see that. I think that's also true, for instance, for Mirage 2000 from Rasbam, with, with French Air Force getting involved a lot. And I think it, it, it must be, there must be a lot of kind of pride when you see your product being used by the, the Air Forces around the world more and more for training. Yeah, very much so. And they've been using the A10C Warthog software for a while. But when they uh, tried out A10C2 Tankler for the first time, uh, they were very uh, quite pleased with the, uh, the progress since then in many different ways. Uh, probably one of the biggest ones was the changes in some of the um, uh, flight dynamics in the uh, steady to chop tone region. Now, when they're using this uh, software, professional users, do they generally use uh, similar hardware to a lot of the entertainment players or do they have specific uh, specialized hardware for it? No, just off the shelf uh, hardware, uh, some really nice PC rigs and gamer chairs, uh, full HOTAS, as you might imagine, they use the uh, Thrustmaster uh, kit. Um, And of course, they do everything in VR. And then if we we could jump quickly, because we spoke about Syria to the maps, uh, so there's been questions of the Marianas maps. What's the ETA or how how does it look? Because that, that one's going to be free, right? It will be a free map. Um, we don't have an ETA on this. It's still very much uh, in progress. Uh, it's coming along very well. And we essentially have like two different map teams right now. And uh, our uh, most experienced team is uh, still wrapping up the channel map. And our more uh, recent team is working on the Marianas right now. And also, this is my personal dream uh, future as a map. Uh, is there any plans or, or even concepts of adding the Vietnam map or, or that region? I think it's definitely a map we want to do at some point. Uh, but before then, we'll need to make sure we have a good uh, sampling of the aircraft that we would need for that conflict. So kind of a chicken for the egg here. So how far out does the roadmap look? that you guys plan, recognizing that roadmaps change all the time. Do you guys generally have a window of uh, two years, three years? How do you how do you look uh, at most it? Most of the stuff we're looking at is probably about three years out at this point. Uh, beyond three years, it starts to get very nebulous. But uh, there are several projects right now we're in work on that have um, you know, terms out to about three years or so. Uh, do you also plan to look back at things that are already in the game but could use some facelifting, like, I don't know, some infantry soldiers, models, and things like that. Some of them are pretty old. And for instance, if you look at the soldier, the U.S. soldier and the Georgian soldier, it looks like different technology used. So mm-hmm. will you be kind of leveling all that at some point? We do, and it's as the resources are available to do it. And uh, yeah, as you can see, we periodically update older 3D models uh, you know, all the time. It's just we have an absolutely huge library of units in the game now. And and the larger, you know, sampling you have in your library, um, the more prone it is to have some of those units be dated um, over the years. So we'll we'll get to them, uh, you know, all in time. It's just, uh, it's a lot of work and we can only work so fast on updating those older objects while at the same time, of course, adding new ones that our players are asking for. Another question that's coming up quite often and that would be in more general terms is uh, the ATC um, system. And there was also an announcement about being updated at some point. You plan to use what you have for supercarrier for that in a way? 
So there's definitely elements of Supercarrier we can transfer over, particularly some of the animations and such. And we're actually um, either hired or in the process of hiring a new staff member to expressly work on airfield ATC systems. So with the uh, carriers, a lot of elements we can transfer over, uh, particularly the uh, animations and such. Obviously, can't use the same character models, of course. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. We actually also have a very good design that we worked with a lot of different um, Navy and Air Force pilots on. But uh, again, it's going to be a lot of work, uh, also the voiceover as well. So we've hired or are going to hire a new staff member to expressly work on this new ATC system for airfields. I think also, I mean, that a lot of work have to go into the whole taxi, parking spot logic, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, for the aircraft, right? Very much so. Well, yeah, so it, it's funny. So whatever you touch, it's always quite a big and daunting task. Nothing seems to be easy. Uh, and it's quite normal, I guess. Yeah, when you have such a large project that uh, talks to so many different other portions of the game, um, it can be a bit daunting and um, uh, prone to issues if you're not careful. Oh, great. No, I was going to, I was going to say that, you know, when we're taking a look, you know, we were talking about super carrier a lot. I mean, obviously a lot of work's been done in that. What is, what's the priority for that next? Uh, the big ones are the uh, ready room, a uh, big uh, VR capable 3d um, uh, place you can occupy uh, with seats and multiplayer, single player uh, mission editor capability, watching the plat cam and so on, just a big community builder. And the second is going to be the Airbus station. Uh, those are the big uh, two items we're working on right now. And the other big third one is the AI direction of um, having the plane directors move aircraft from their starting locations to the catapults and then from the box out of the box to their parking positions. Wow, that sounds amazing. Yeah, those are the uh, the big items uh, that we're working on now. That's great, and and of course I'll I'll hold you to it. When's it going to be ready? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, uh, as soon as we have a good feel for that, we'll definitely let you guys know. Oh, uh, that will be something. Um, yeah, it, it, super current super carrier as it is now. It already boosts the immersion by like three hundred percent compared to old tennis. But those additions will will be even better. So can't wait for that. So when we're looking at, you know, one of the things that was brought up and I've, I've, I know there's been a lot of talk on it across a number of different podcasts and people interviewed, what's your take on the Microsoft flight simulator, a uh, new release of that? Well, uh, technically speaking, it's absolutely amazing what they've done in terms of rendering the world, the weather and the lighting system, just absolutely fabulous. Uh, something to emulate and they definitely set a bar there. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but, of course, it's a very, very different product than what we offer in DCS. Um, whereas in DCS, we're focused on combat systems and different eras of, of combat. And the, the system I think, works very well for modern day civil systems. But unfortunately, it doesn't provide the capability to save destroying bridges and buildings. It can allow us to... Uh, render uh, England in 1945, for example. So there's also big limitations to that tech technology for what we want to do in DCS world. So there's certainly um, areas of the software that we're looking very hard at to improve our product, um, but by no means can you essentially just do a one-for-one -one transfer right. of that technology into DCS and make it work. So as you're as you're looking at it, one of the things that people have been talking about is the Vulcan API and uh, mm -hmm. that, and that's and I think I remember which podcast I heard it on, but uh, I think that's that's certainly uh, not a 2020 solution. Is that correct? I, I don't know about the date. I'm always uh, me particularly. I'm very careful sure. about giving dates out these days until I'm 100% sure about something because unfortunately, no matter how we caveat it, um, two days later, I come across as a promise. And we're, I'm just very, very careful about those type of things now. Yeah, understood completely. Yeah, I, and um, trust me, I actually had a, a project that I was working on where uh, we released and then the developer had TMJ surgery. 
and we had a bug mm. and there was a number of things. So it's, I understand the complexities and how things that, but, um, but as we, as we look towards the future, the Vulcan API is, is one of the pieces mm -hmm. that is being. Oh, very, very much so. It's, it's again, you know, like the dynamic campaign, it's something we have dedicated staff on, i uh, work on every day. And it's something we hope to, you know, start uh, testing at least internally, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, but you know, when it rolls out to public, of course, will, you know, depend on testing, performance, retesting. Um, yeah, there's a whole process there. So it's definitely coming, but I can't give you an exact date on when exactly that will be at this Understood. point. So, so I'm just thinking when you're looking back to old DCS and 2.5 or mm -hmm. 2.6, uh, where we are now, uh, mm -hmm. but it's the same, like the groundworks. I'm, I'm not an expert on that. So the, the engine, game engine, if you will, is the same or it, it changed, it evolved a lot. So it's a completely different thing than it was. Well, as you might imagine, there's actually different engines, so to speak. There's no single like DCS engine. We have our mm -hmm. graphics engine, we have our AI engine, uh, the weather system engine, AI engine, and, and so on, different APIs. Um, but also it really depends on, say, what map you're looking at. Um, you know, the, the version of the DCS train engine that was used to build the current Caucasus map is quite different than the one that we used to build the channel map, for instance. So it can, uh, and also, and then when we do the Marianas map, it'll be a later version than the channel map. So it really varies over time of uh, when is something built based on the tools available at that time. But it also means it's very modular, so you can improve different parts uh, mm -hmm. independently Absolutely. of each other. Well, that's very good. It has to be that way, yeah. Oh, wait, one, one that's also coming up quite often uh, mm -hmm. is about the civilian AI aircraft that could be added DCS is something you're looking at, or just the reason why it's not there? Uh, it's something we want to do, but as I was mentioning before, it's just a matter of the time and resources of having someone available to make those assets. When we have, you know, folks saying, "Well, you need to update, you know, the B-52 from 50 years ago," or you need to add, um, you know, this, you know, Pansier SAM system. It's you know an allocation of those resources to make the most number of customers happy. And um, that's always a very difficult thing. Another question that I have linked to that is uh, a, a model of a pilot, a ejected pilot. Is it something that will be added? It would be very good to have for the, all these CSAR missions. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, it doesn't sound like a broken record, but yeah, it's something we definitely want to do. It's just a matter <laughs> of finding the resources to build those new objects. Just hinting, that, that, that would be a nice, probably an easy addition. Um, this stage, yeah, but, it's all easy. Yeah, it's and important. it kind of brings up an interesting point. I think this is, at least for me, years and years ago when I, when I got in this industry, um, the realization I came to that it's not a case that most developers, you know, don't know about a feature or don't want to do a feature or anything like that. It's usually quite the opposite. It's a case of having the time and resources to actually do it. That's the trick. And, you know, having the staff available, the management to organize it, make that a reality is you know a real trick of a successful studio it's uh it's not about you know, you know having an understanding of what to do and don't get me wrong um our online community is an amazing resource for us and we couldn't be there uh without them and they do often you know bring up uh, ideas and points that maybe we had not considered that in the end make a much better product yeah for sure and I'm wondering, you know, so one of the things that you're focused on um, has been, I, th I believe, more of the World War II genre more recently. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that in direction where that's going? So I'm a little out of my depth here. So we have a separate producer, uh, Sergey, who that's his baby. Uh, my baby in terms of uh, managing and design tends to be more on the modern day side. But... Um, you know, right now we're trying to, you know, obviously flesh out you know, the channel map and the current aircraft. And a huge element of, of that, of course, is the damage model, which we're getting really close to putting that into the open beta for people to start testing. And that's going to be, I think, a really big sea state change of the World War II combat. Uh, in addition to that, there's going to be some really nice associated AI 
updates to the World War II aircraft that I think in combination between the AI and the uh, damage modeling, it'll really bring it up uh, several notches. But um, so right now, most of the work, of course, is focused on the uh, World War uh, European side. But one of the things we want to do with the Marianas map is not just have uh, what we're developing right now is a modern day version uh, focused around uh, Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, but then later on do a World War II version. And then you have some really interesting uh, options there of Battle of Saipan, Guam, um, Battle of the Philippine Sea, and a lot of really interesting uh, potential World War II work in that area. Yeah. So World War II is it's something that we're definitely not shying away from. We're putting a huge amount of resource into it. And our goal is to be the best World War II flight sim out there. And of course, this also then pairs with, you know, uh, what I was mentioning earlier about dynamic campaign system. And speaking about maps, I, I think I heard somewhere that the kind of ultimate plan is at some point far in the future is to try to connect them. So when you get more and more maps to, to be able to transfer between them, uh, is that something that's on, on your mind or as a plan for distant future? Well, we're definitely looking at a whole earth model world, uh, exactly how that would be mechanized with the existing maps. We simply don't know right now. Um, it's just a little too early to give you an answer on that. Syria, I was going to say Syria is amazing. I think the amount of detail on it, it is just fantastic. Yep. Uh, you did a great job on that map. So yeah, and speaking of Ugra, they're uh, very busy still. Um, the, the big thing they're working on right now, of course, is adding Cyprus. But it's not just Cyprus. In order to kind of uh, square off the map, uh, they also have to include a large portion of southern Turkey along the coast uh, north of Cyprus. So there's uh, quite a bit to add there as well. So that's their uh, big task right now is updating uh, that portion of the map. Well, currently it's a very hot zone from Cyprus through Syria and everywhere around. So possible yeah, thousands of years. <laughs> well, it's, it's good potential for many different campaigns, in the many different uh, time frames. Now, do, do any of the tools today, whether we're talking about AI or, you know, mapping help speed up any of the map development process? So we go through different versions we call our TDK or terrain development kit. And you know, over time, it improves, gets better, more shortcuts, more efficiency. So, yeah, over time, it definitely does get better. And you know, just like third-party aircraft, we do have options for uh, third-party map builders. But just like third-party aircraft, we have a uh, pretty rigorous set of hoops now uh, established that a potential third-party developer would have to meet in order to have a license agreement and access to those um, SDK or the TDK in this case for the map. So our hope is though that in not too distant future, and actually Razvan of course is already working on uh, the Falklands map, that will have more and more uh, third party maps out there as well. No, I just think it's really neat when we think about, I, I just, you know, when I think about how um, AI today is being leveraged to create new things, uh, It'd be interesting to see, uh, and, and again, not that the technologies are necessarily compatible. But I was just curious in terms of mapping or things like that. If there was, but now it's um, understood that anything that has to get, you know, part of the become part of the ecosystem absolutely has to meet uh, the very high standard. Mm. Yeah, and again, I'm a bit out of my depth on the TDK and the um, specifics of how it actually functions in terms of using AI automation. Um, I'm not as uh, versed on that part of the, um, the product. One more question about the models coming back a little bit. <clears throat> have, uh, have you or a team ever thought about uh, adding some tactical airlift uh, aircraft like C-130, C-17 or something like that? What do you think? Yeah, that's as player control aircraft, I yeah. assume? Yeah. Um, we've talked about it. Uh, honestly, it'd probably be more probable for that to be a third-party aircraft. Uh, unfortunately, uh, to be brutally honest, uh, an aircraft like that just um, would be lucky if it broke even in terms of our investment into the project. Yeah, I think it would make sense mostly for multiplayer. Uh, that would be something to do for it, yeah. 
you know, there's definitely, you know, some vocal proponents of such an aircraft, but in terms of the larger scheme of things, in terms of our marketplace, uh, the number of sales for that type of product um, would in all likelihood pale a comparison to other craft we can do. And, uh, but, but then I, that may link to another question, which is the future of the combined arms. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, probably with, with combined arms being developed further, especially for the multiplayer, th there would be place for some strategic air, air lifts, etc. So mm -hmm. are there any plans to deliver or, or expand combined arms? There are, but there has to be some prerequisites first. In order to do this right, uh, first we have to have a really good damage modeling system for ground units. Uh, you know, for example, the guys over ESIM, Alamis guys, have done a fantastic job with Steel Beast. We need to be at that level in terms of the modeling of those systems. Um, I don't want it to be a, um, a health bar for a ground unit if we go to combined arms too. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, in order to really do it right, we need to have a much even higher uh, degree of elevation mesh detail and objects for that level of an environment. So people can actually, you know, go really easily go down in a hold down position in a realistic manner and feel like they're really on a battlefield and not on a, a, a terrain made of intersecting planes. Um, it has, those two items really have to be there first before we can really move strongly into a combined arms too. Oh, so with the modular, modular build, I hope I'm looking forward to what you can do about that part as well. It's uh, even with combined arm as they are now, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun sometimes uh, to play a JTAC or especially the multiplayer again, but I'm, I'm looking forward to what you can well, do. The inter interesting thing about combined arms was it actually was an outgrowth of the JTAC we built for a potential uh, professional client. And once we build the uh, uh, JTAC system, they want also the ability to move units around through the F10 map. And as we start adding those features. So kind of like I was talking about before about the A10 projects initially being a defense project that then got rolled into an entertainment product. Actually the combined arms in, in many ways is um, the same story. So basically, if we want to see something completely new, we should we should um, push on our defense ministers, etc. That's right. <laughs> that would <laughs> certainly help. No doubt about that. Yeah, we're going to lobby. Uh, yeah. So if you want your F twenty two sim, start yeah. lobbying Congress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, at least we now have the path forward. We know how to make it happen. There you go. <laughs> so not, not through the wish list on the forums. I'm joking. But, well, I think I'm mean, just, again, looking at the questions here, and uh, I guess we've asked most of them because some of them you've answered without even asking. Mm -hmm. and they were very similar. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, and, yeah, Rob, anything to add? Well, I would just open it up and say, um, is there anything that, you know, as we take a look at it, is there anything that you'd like to just say, hey, here's what's going on or anything we haven't covered that you'd like to share with the community? Well, I think you guys uh, and your questions really gave a pr pretty good overview of you know, our current priorities of you know where we're striving for. And uh, I guess what I'll close with, and I know Nick mentions this often because it's true and it's not just lip service, that we cannot do these games without you guys, our customers. Uh, it just won't happen. And uh, yeah, of course, we do our professional products, but that's not what runs this company. It's the entertainment side. Um, so without you guys, there are no products. And you know, that's the reason I do this too is, I think we are talking before we started doing this video, uh, is that you know, this is a passion, not just for me, but a lot of these, a lot of the guys on this team. And we're also making these games not just for you, but also for us, because we're also simmers and want to make the best game possible. And, you know, of course, there are going to be hiccups um, now and then. And we do you know, apologize for those. Uh, I think things have gotten better since we've moved to a different open beta release strategy. Uh, but we're striving to do better all the time. Uh, we're definitely not perfect. And we will continue to try to do better. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I... Um... 
just as a comment, I think I've seen in the last few months that everything seemed very, very stable. Yeah, right? that's great to hear. And I think it's a combination of you know slowing down the open beta releases a bit, but also we've hired a pretty extensive closed beta team. And these guys have also been invaluable in helping uh, root out issues before they went into release versions. So you know, hats off to those guys as well. well the community I've always been saying is uh, just echoing what you said. Again, from the point of view of a campaign developer, I would never be able to do a campaign without them because they. This is the main source of voice actors, of subject matter experts, and they just do it because they love Sims. They do exactly. it for free. It's it's incredible. So, hats off to the whole community. Exactly. Well, thanks again, Matt. I really appreciate it. And uh, I think at this point, are you ready to close out Baltic? I think so. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very well, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Air Combat Sim. Don't forget to subscribe or tell a friend about it. If you have a question, idea for an episode, or a special guest you'd like us to invite, feel free to reach out on Facebook, Discord, or via email. Air Combat Sim was brought to you by BBR Productions.